Hello everyone, and welcome to what I'm calling Rape Culture, a case study. So I want to talk about an experience that a friend of mine had. I got her permission to share this story. I have changed all of the names. I'm going to call my friend Olivia. And Olivia experienced something that I'll set up in a moment first. I think it's important if we're talking about rape culture, uh, we should define it. And I know it's kind of difficult to define for a lot of people, but I just Googled it and the Google dictionary came up with a definition that I thought worked really well. So I'm going to use that. And that is a society or environment whose prevailing social attitudes have the effect of normalizing or trivializing sexual assault and abuse. Now, a lot of people decry uh, the calls of rape culture and say that it's uh, overreacting to say that we have a rape culture, uh, that it's something different than that. Um, I would like to present this as a case study. I know it's only anecdotal, but I think all of these anecdotal things help uh, to uh, add to the pile when talking about these things. So it's important to note, um, this is a series of text messages that went between Olivia and someone who I'm calling Ted. Um, the important things are that Ted is, runs a poly group, uh, and this is referring to an event at which this poly group um, uh, has a, a place. Um, they, I, I honestly don't know many details about it, but they, they are set up at this event. And it doesn't matter what the event is, or where it is, or where it takes place. Um, I, I want to keep everything as kind of generalized as possible because I think this is indicative of a lot of things, at least in the U.S. This happened after uh, they were doing some sort of setup. I think it was maybe packing lunches and things like that. I honestly probably should have talked to Olivia a little bit more before this, find out some details. But there was, a, there was an event where she went to help out. Uh, and uh, Ted was there, and the other person in this, uh, who I am calling Arthur, uh, was there as well. And you'll see how that all plays into it once I start reading. Um, there are quite a few back and forths here, and I'm going to try to offer commentary as I go, even if at times it will be answered later in the texts, if that makes sense. So let's start, start out with it here. This is from Olivia. Hi Ted, it was so great to see you. Thank you so much for being an incredible organizer and host. Define this how you will, but after visiting over the weekend, I understand a lot more about why I haven't been back to event since I camped with Polygroup in 2016. I just want to share my experience so that you're aware that someone in your camp does not do well at listening to boundaries. That's something that we could all work on, I admit, but the problem here is that I approached him about my discomfort over him crossing my boundaries that I set before things happened. Instead of listening, he tried to put me down. He told me I was too weak for him and that he was disappointed in me. This is not the type of response any respectful person would give to someone talking about their sexual boundaries. I set two specific boundaries in the first place, condom use and no hickeys. One, he convinced me to cross by vaguely putting me down, which is uncomfortable on its own. The other boundary I set, he disregarded altogether. And no, I don't know which is which, I don't think it uh, matters really. My heart sank when I saw that Arthur attended the work party. I responded to that by drinking heavily and pretending that he wasn't there. I will probably do the same if I see him in the future. All I ask for me is that you help me watch things so that our shifts aren't at the same time as polygroup meetups, if at all possible. If I'm stuck making a meal right next to him, I might just leave and make the meal later. In fact, I'll probably leave any situation that makes me uncomfortable around him. With a response like the one he gave me when I told him he already crossed my boundaries, he doesn't deserve to even be acknowledged by me anymore. You may just want to keep an eye out for any future abuse. Thanks for hearing me out. I miss you guys, and regardless of the hesitation seeing him as caused, I intend on making it in 2020. So, a few things here. Um, you'll note that Olivia mainly asked for two things. One, to make sure that they don't have shifts together. 
Uh, and two, um, to kind of keep an eye out, since if this happened to her, it could happen to other people as well. Um, and I think she was very specific here and uh, spoke very in, in a detailed and eloquent manner about exactly what happened and what happened when she confronted him about it. Now, I understand this puts Ted in a difficult position. It's no fun to kind of deal with these sorts of things. Um, you have a poly group that's uh, most likely, it sounds like, uh, a fairly uh, <laughs> sex positive, or at least wanting to be sex positive and wanting to be flirty and fun uh, sort of interaction. And so Ted sent something back, and I don't actually have that captured. Uh, but it was something like, thanks for letting me know this, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on it. It was just kind of a like, you know, this requires a longer response, but I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, which I think is uh, perfectly fine, um, although obviously a little nerve-wracking for Olivia. Um, but so, here's what he wrote back when... He wrote back in detail, and this I'm going to uh, comment on quite a bit as we go through it. Uh, so, it begins... Thanks so much for taking the time to write me about your experiences with Arthur. Guess in the end, there are several people that have issue with him and his aggressive nature of the past. So I think this is a really good start because it sounds to me like Ted took this information and didn't just think, how can I sweep this under the carpet? His first thought was, can I corroborate that this has happened to other people? Because, man, when it comes to sexual boundaries and consent and things like that, there's obviously a lot of gray area. Um, you know, there, there, are there are obviously opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, yes, yes, take me now, and no, stop, this is rape, being kind of extremes, but in the middle there's a lot of gray area, right? And so, I, I think it was uh, uh, very wise of Ted to reach out and, and see if, you know, is this uh, Olivia misinterpreting events, or is this something that other people have experienced as well? So it sounds like he's found that, oh wow, uh, in the end there are several people that have issue with him and his aggressive nature. So that to me says, okay, these are big warning signs. What does he plan to do about it? To continue, it is a very sticky slope starting down the road of deciding who you let in and keep in your circle. Which, okay, sure. Uh, but you would think that someone with corroborated evidence of sexual aggression in your assumedly sex-positive, poly, open uh, get-together, you wouldn't want, right? <laughs> it's like, it's a sticky slope to decide who at the zoo gets to go free roam, but probably not the tigers, right? In the 20 years I've been running Polygroup, I have only put one person in the permanently outside the circle, and I am pretty proud of that. There are many people whom I may not like, many people whose personality is not to my liking, or things they do are not what I would do, but does that warrant not be allowed to camp with us or be involved in activities? And there is some little text, like, that doesn't relate to speech well, and I'm not trying to make fun of that or anything, like, it's just text, but I just want to read what's exactly there and not um, assume anything. I'm kind of confused what he's trying to say here. Uh, on, on one hand, I get it. Uh, you know, maybe there are some Republicans in the group, or maybe there are some people in the group who view women as objects, and that's not really his thing, but as long as the women are comfortable with it, then does it really matter? I, I mean, I don't know. He could be saying a lot of things here, and I totally get that, uh, but d does that apply here? Because um, what he's saying is essentially like, now, him disregarding boundaries <laughs> may not be something I agree with personally, but where do you draw the line? Um, I would think multiple corroborated accounts of him not respecting boundaries would be a good place to draw the line myself. He continues, I have had many situations over the years where a potential camper has said to me, if this person camps with you, then I cannot. My fallback position is you have to work out what you need to work out or make what decision you need to do for you. 
If I tried to keep track of who does not like who and keep certain people out because of it, I might go bonkers. Again, fair enough. Two things though. One, Olivia did confront Arthur to try to deal with it, and he handled it pretty poorly, I would say. Or maybe it's not so much that he handled it poorly, but he handled it in a way that was so negative that it doesn't reflect well on his character. So she did confront him. The other thing is that this isn't what Olivia is saying. She's saying, just please don't set me up with the same shifts as him. He continues, Know that I am in no way blowing off or disregarding your interactions with Arthur. I will certainly have a conversation with him about his behavior. Now, my question here is, why not have that conversation before writing this text? Because, for instance, I do think that people can change, and I do think that people can have regrets about how they acted. It's not clear from Olivia's text, and I didn't ask her about it, when she confronted Arthur. Did she confront him years ago when this happened, and that was his reaction, or did she confront him at the, uh, uh, the get-together group that just happened very recently? Because if she confronted him years ago, maybe if Ted talked to Arthur now uh, and said, you know, hey, I've heard about this and I've heard other stories as well. What's your response to it? If Arthur's response was, oh man, I am so sorry. I know I acted inappropriately and I've gone through a lot of changes since then. I've read a lot and I, I don't know. I do yoga now, whatever. Point being, if Arthur was contrite and seemed honestly contrite, then I could see saying, you know, hey, I, uh, uh, people can change and that's something that uh, we encourage here and I think that you will have fewer problems with him. And on the other hand, if Arthur was like, oh, what did that bitch say now? Then it's like, okay, then he's adamantly holding on to his position and do I want to deal with somebody like that in my sex positive poly society and i keep adding sex positive because i i, I mean i just assume that it is because it's like a poly get together where they really encourage like togetherness and uh, working with each other all the time and uh, a very laissez-faire attitude attitude <laughs> towards uh, sexuality um but i don't know maybe <laughs> maybe ted's completely sex negative is anybody that eh, whatever i I want to say also there could be a, a middle ground where Arthur was just uncomfortable and was like, oh man, you know, th this is how I interpreted it. She says that I cross boundaries. I don't think so. And, and then that uh, puts you in a difficult situation. But if you get one of the two other extremes, it seems like that answers the question of how to deal with things, right? But for some reason, he hasn't had that conversation before getting back with Olivia. And that seems odd to me. He continues, just as people might be bad in the past, I always err on the side that people change and grow and bad past mistakes are not present behavior. Again, fair enough, but isn't confronting him about it something that you should do to see if that applies? Uh, because giving Arthur the benefit of the doubt here, if he has changed, confronting him about it before writing this, would give you the opportunity to view that and to pass that along to Olivia and to say, you know, I understand if you're not comfortable with him and I'm totally going to keep your shift separate, but I, I believe him when he says that he's changed. He seems to understand that he was in the wrong. So I, I certainly agree that redemption is possible, but to just assume that? I mean, that's like saying... Let's let Charles Manson out of jail because, I mean, it's been a while. He's probably, he's probably really sorry by now. He continues, I am glad that his presence will not keep you from being part of the polygroup family at event. The both of you have your own distractions now, aka time has moved forward and you have a great guy and he has two women and a baby. I have a lot of problems with this sentence with this sentiment. I guess this sentence too. With this sentiment. So, what, what I think, 
I don't even want to get Ted the benefit of the doubt here. Screw that. Um, it really seems to me here like he's saying, look, he's going to be really busy. Like, he's got to take care of two women and a baby. I mean, that's a lifetime movie on its own, right? And hey, you have a guy now, so there's no reason for you to be slutting it up with some random guy. You probably aren't even going to hook up with him. That's not what this is about at all, and that's pretty slut shamey coming from someone who runs a, a poly group. So, I'm uh, uh, pretty uncomfortable with that sentence and sentiment there. And again, I get that it's been a while, but if he's suffered no consequences and had no reason to self-reflect, why do you assume that he must have changed? I will certainly make sure that you do not cook the same meals or what have you. I encourage you to let me know if things get weird and I will deal in the moment and make sure that his behavior stays on the level. Now that he is a package of three, again, he keeps bringing this up as if that makes any difference. You know, it's like saying, oh, well, he molested kids in the past, but now he's got a kid of his own. I mean, who has the time, right? It's, it's, this, we're talking about a pattern here. It's not about does he have the spare time to give to molesting. Um, and, and, and molestation is not the right word here. Uh, uh, maybe assault is, is even too strong. I don't even want to... I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to throw Arthur under the bus as much as I might want to here. This is more a discussion about the culture, and I'll get into that more once we've finished with this response, which is fairly long, and i got to give Ted credit for that. He at least tried to be very thorough about this. He continues, Now that he is a package of three, it becomes even more difficult to exclude people because Daisy, Lisa, and the baby have not been creepy. Okay, this is just utterly ridiculous as an argument. This is like saying, you know, oh, well, this guy uh, stole from a store, but we can't put him in jail because he's got a wife and kid. I mean, that's you, you shouldn't punish him because then his wife and kid will be punished. No, I mean, if, if someone did something wrong, then those around them are probably going to get hurt. Punishment exists so that we will understand the consequences for our actions, right? And some of the consequences affect those around us. That's the whole point of it. Let's finish this off here. Thanks for putting a hurtful situation into words so as event leader, I can be aware of the things that my campers are experiencing. Always trying to find a balance of radical inclusion and keeping all campers safe and happy at event. We can certainly continue this discussion if you feel it is warranted. On another note, it was amazing to see you for the work party. You look happy, sans the uncomfortably with Arthur being there. Thanks for traveling to spend time with us. That last bit to me seems like he's trying to push the whole, like, you have a significant other now. So, hey, I'm glad that you're happy with that, because apparently you weren't real happy just slutting it up. <laughs> Which is infuriating, right? I, I do really appreciate that he said we can certainly continue this discussion if you feel it is warranted. Um, putting that if you feel it is warranted seems a little condescending, but it is opening the pathway to talk more about it. At the beginning, I said that he's in a difficult position here, and I think here he really uh, spells out what his difficulty is, trying to balance radical inclusion and keeping all campers safe and happy. So on the one side, you have public safety, and on the other side, you want to have inclusion. For instance, if somebody said, oh, there's a trans girl working here, and that makes me uncomfortable, you wouldn't want to exclude the trans girl because of that, right? You want to have... I, I, I think that's what he's saying. Like, radical inclusion, meaning everybody is welcome here. All walks of life, you know, whether, uh, uh, you know, like, like they want to destroy ableism and, and racism and sexism and, and all those things. And I, I get that. I get what he's saying. But... Does radical inclusion mean that you're okay with someone who is, uh, has apparently had multiple uh, assault claims against him? Because 
That is my cat. Because then maybe uh, that's a little too radical of inclusion? Again, I get that he's in a difficult situation here, but if you're going to be an event leader like he is, then I think you've got to have a plan for dealing with this. And he's trying to have his cake and eat it too, saying, I'm totally listening to you and I really appreciate that you came forward about this, but there are going to be no consequences even though I corroborated it and um, just try to stick with the person you're with because then maybe you won't get into trouble like this. And I want to read Olivia's response to this as well in a moment, but right now I think this is the point at which I want to talk about rape culture and how this plays into it. Rape culture in many ways is a form of gaslighting because it trivializes or uh, glorifies uh, sexual assault. This, I think, is far more the trivialized uh, form, uh, but essentially it's saying what you experienced doesn't really matter as much as you think it matters. Uh, what you experienced was a long time ago, so get over it. And maybe don't sleep with random people if you don't want to have negative consequences. And I, it's fair, I mean, I think uh, to a certain extent it's fair to say that if you sleep with random people it might not be what you want, but when you are straightforward about your, you know, it's, it's one thing if it's like, uh, he used a little more tongue than I was comfortable with, versus I set up boundaries and he crossed them. And Ted here for sure seems to be assuming that the former falls under the, or the latter falls under the category of the former. And it's a very, very different thing. It's saying that setting up boundaries and having people cross them is not that big a deal. Um, and probably he's gotten better. And there won't be any consequences. This is the reason why it's gaslighting, because it's essentially saying your interpretation of reality, which is that when you have boundaries and somebody crosses them, that's a bad thing and you should say something about it, and there should be consequences for the person who doesn't do it, just as there would be consequences if you disregarded boundaries. But I hear you, and I care that you said this, but I'm not going to do anything about it. When those in charge react this way over and over again, it makes Olivia and other people doubt their own sanity and their own reality. I think a lot of us have had a taste of this, even those of us who are, you know, cishet, white, um, uh, male or female. Um, um, during this election, where suddenly reality doesn't seem to mean <laughs> as much anymore. It's like, you know, we suddenly have alternative facts and so on and so forth. And it's like, you do start to feel that kind of Star Trek The Next Generation Picard, like I finally, I saw two lights or whatever it was, you know what I mean? Uh, you really start to doubt your own reality. And this is what's going on here. And I know that I, I feel 100% certain that Ted wasn't like, how can I drive her crazy? But by ignoring the reality of the situation and focusing more on what I feel was a desire not to have to deal with it, you know, just to sweep it under the carpet more than anything else. By doing that, he really trivializes Olivia's reality. And I think uh, that's an important thing to understand when dealing with rape culture. And I think that sometimes we need these case studies to look at and think about. And, you know, those of you who maybe fall closer to the side of rape culture doesn't exist might have read that and thought that I was being a little harsh. But hopefully you can understand at this point what I'm saying and, and, and why this is important. Because it really does, it, it really is gaslighting on so many levels. And again, I don't think Ted is consciously doing that. But when that is presented to you, that's how you have to interpret it. Let me go through her response to him. 
Thank you for putting together such a well thought out response. I understand you have confirmed his nature with others, but I don't understand why if nothing is going to be done about it. I'm disappointed that it's more important to be inclusive than worry about consent and the comfort of these several people you speak of. Eventually, more people will learn that disregarding a sexual boundary is sexual assault. I'm curious to know how a discussion about boundaries with him might help, especially when he doesn't admit to these behaviors. I don't understand how anything less than a point system, three strikes you're out, would not be ignoring the situation. This is more than being unliked. I regret being vulnerable about this with you. I did not suggest for Arthur to be kicked out of the group, regardless of you thoroughly defending that. But I don't see how talking is going to help either, regardless of how it is talked about. Thank you in advance for helping me schedule my meals around him." So I know that Olivia said to me that she maybe regretted being a little too harsh, but you know, I said, look, if he can't understand why you're a little <laughs> harsh and, as the kids say, salty about this, then uh, he's kind of an idiot. So uh, I'm sure that you can understand why she might be lashing out a, a little bit here. Let's continue. This is a poly group. I was happily partnered in 2016, he just didn't want to go that year. I've been in several relationships over the years. I don't understand what me being in a relationship with someone has to do with anything, but apparently that's a way to judge my changes and my happiness. It's also good to know that a predator can hide behind, the, can hide behind their own family and relationships, as if it gives them a pass. Thanks for hearing me out. Ultimately, everything is your choice. I respect that, and I can still respect you while seeing what is going on at the same time. Again, like I said, and Olivia recognizes it too, that Ted isn't trying to gaslight her. It, it's just this way of the fact that we live in a rape culture where giving someone a pass is just easier than dealing with consequences. Okay, honey. I know how it is supporting this type of thing, and it's not any different within this sex-positive culture either. At the very least, I've mentioned this in case more people decide to come forward. That's more important than this discomfort of sharing my experience with you. So what will Ted take away from this experience? Will he write, us off, write it off as, you know, this crazy bitch got into something that she wasn't ready for, and now she's lashing out about it, and maybe she's kind of jealous or something like that? Because I certainly think that that's a possible read that he could have. I know it's not accurate, but I could see him thinking that. Or will he come away and think, oh, maybe I could have handled that better? Or will he come away and think, man, I really should do something about Arthur here? I hope that he at least reflects on it somewhat. And I know for certain how it affected Olivia. She self-medicated and uh, drank heavily and later felt like shit. Because how do you react when your reality is drawn into question? How do you react when you're told your pain doesn't matter? Your experiences don't matter. Um, coming forward doesn't matter. Really, you shouldn't bother with it because it just dredges up old memories for you to type it out and it makes no difference. Because it's not real. It doesn't matter. But thank you, thank you. I'm listening to you. Awesome, glad you have somebody. It's patronizing. And it's dismissive. And it's frustrating because, again, as I said, I get that Ted's in a difficult position. But until we start having these discussions, for instance, I don't know what the perfect response here is. I think that after getting that story corroborated, you would maybe at least have a discussion with Arthur before saying anything and finding out what he says to these claims. Uh, because, y you know, th that's the thing. He keeps trying to pass it off as if it was a long time ago. It was 2016. It's 2019 now. Three months into 2019. So it was less than three years ago. That is not like lifetimes. It's not like Arthur did 10 in the state pen and now he's back and can't he just be forgiven, right? And my question is, the people who corroborated this story, when did their experiences happen? Uh, maybe if they all happened like pre-2010 or something, then I could understand him kind of saying, oh, okay, this is, you know, he's had a moral progression 
and he's reached a point where he's much better. But that isn't clear. Hell, for all I know, maybe there was a typo in there, and we're misunderstanding when he said that, oh, it looks like this isn't the first time. Maybe he meant to say, looks like this is the first time, and just didn't notice it, didn't correct it, and so we've been misinterpreting this whole thing. But uh, taking, you know, just like I believe what Olivia says, I'm going to believe what Ted said um, in what he typed and assume that he probably checked that a couple of times before sending it because it was a pretty lengthy text and he obviously didn't want to piss her off. But he did want to ignore her. I don't have any immediate solutions, but I hope that this has at least made you think. And I would love to hear your feedback. What do you think of all of this? What do you think would be the proper way to respond. I, I think I've made my thoughts pretty clear on it, but how do you guys feel out there? Um, I'd love to hear feedback. Anyway, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Thank you so much for listening and being part of this. Be kind.